distinguished dignitaries. Thank you all. Sir, may we now have your words of wisdom, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Ramachandran Thakerat, Vice Chancellor of QSAT, Professor Paulos Jacob, Pro Vice Chancellor, my very good friend and political colleague, Sri Haibi Eden, MLA, member of the syndicate, Dr. Bhasi, professors, students, media, well wishers, friends. I hope that covers everybody. Ella recommend the Vinita Mayanamaskaram. It's a real pleasure to be here to inaugurate the multi-storied Students' Amenity Center. I asked the Vice Chancellor what was in the center and he gave me this very impressive list. And I was reading it and thinking back to my own student days at Delhi University, where of the entire thing in this list, I think all we had literally was a bank and that was a good uh, 10 or 15 minutes walk from my campus. But you have not only a bank, you have a gym. Gyms were unheard of in my student days. You have a laundry. My gosh, that's amazing. A barber shop. <laughs> Badminton court. Counseling center. Post office. That's a great convenience, especially since I hear that you have students from 24 states. So if they're still writing letters home, the post office will be a big blessing. More likely, they're receiving money orders from home, so the post office will also be a, a big blessing. Students' union office, everything else. And curiously enough, a ladies' waiting room. Why are the ladies waiting? Who are they waiting for? <laughs> In my time, ladies never waited. We had to wait for them. <laughs> so my advice to the ladies is uh, don't, let, don't let there be a waiting room. You do your own thing and let these young gentlemen wait for you. But, uh, <laughs> but jokes apart, I'm delighted that you have this multi-storied amenity. Three floors, each floor has uh, all these provisions, also toilets have been thought about. It seems to me a very, very sensible use of eight crores of the Cochin University of Science and Technology's very scarce funds. Because ultimately, what makes a university are the people in it the faculty, the administration, and the students. And by and large, in the Indian university environment, the faculty and administration know how to look after themselves, but the students tend, by and large, to be neglected. So I'm very pleased that QSAT has set an excellent example for all of us by providing such thorough facilities for all the students of this excellent campus. I know that QSAT is poised on the brink of a major transition. When I became Minister of State for Human Resource Development just over a year ago, a year and a month ago, I remember one of the first files that was brought to my attention was the pending request to upgrade QSAT into an IIEST, an Indian Institute for Education and Science and Technology. You also know that this being Kerala, in the file, there were a large number of letters from faculty of QSAT saying, we don't want it to become an IEIEST. And a lot of bureaucratic time was expended in trying to find out whether this was indeed reflective of the majority opinion in the campus, whether really there was a good argument for um, not converting or upgrading QSAT. Uh, and as a result, we went through pages and pages in the official files considering, analyzing, rebutting the various arguments made by the disgruntled faculty members who would much rather remain a QSAT than become an IEST. But I'm pleased to say that the conclusion, uh, and certainly let me be very blunt and say my own words on the file were uncompromisingly in favor of this upgrading. QSAT is an excellent institution. It is very highly reputed and very highly respected across Kerala. But it is an institution with national potential. And there are always limitations on what a state government can do when it comes to funding and financial support 
for high quality technical institutions. The kind of work, the kind of research you're all doing requires funding. And I know the state government has been helpful. Hybe himself was in the forefront of efforts to persuade the finance minister to put some additional resources here. But if it becomes an IEST, the funding will of course be at a different order. So too will the aspiration level and so too will the demands on the faculty, which may be why some of them preferred to remain in their comfortable positions today. Let me stress that this is not yet a completed process, but it's moving in a very positive direction. Uh, as I said, the, the files uh, uh, have, have essentially dismissed the uh, objections by various faculty members. Uh, it is very clear that the administration, the majority of the faculty, and the student community would like to see the upgrading, and the state government is solidly behind the proposal. Now, there are just three more hurdles to be crossed. The first is the planning commission, which has to allocate the funding for any new central institution. The matter is currently before the planning commission and is being strongly supported by my ministry, the Ministry of Human Resource Development. Once the planning commission has come up with an indicative figure, we need the involvement of the finance ministry because they're the ones who actually have the money. They have to give the money and say, all right, for uh, the next fiscal year, the next academic year, it will be X crores. That is the second stage. And the final stage, which by then we hope will be just a formality, would be the approval of the cabinet, because without the cabinet approving it, this cannot become a reality. Then there is also a technical requirement of an ordinance or later a bill, but that will be again not controversial. So the difficult part is over. The slightly less difficult but not easy part is happening now. And when that is all done, we hope to have good news to announce before too long. And certainly we hope before the next elections seals all our lips. You know, it's very interesting, however, that for the last few years, there has been a lot of breast beating in our country about the fact that none of our universities features in the top 200 of the world rankings issued by three different world ranking organizations, the Times Higher Education Ranking, the QES or Quacarelli Simons Ranking, and the Shanghai Jiantong Ranking. All of these three rankings do not feature a single Indian university in the top 200. Now initially, I think we were unnecessarily defensive. My minister used to answer in parliament that these rankings are not relevant to us, they're not relevant to Indian conditions, they don't matter. That, I think, was not a convincing answer. But now we've gone to the other extreme, and everybody is complaining about the rankings. Even the president of India, in a couple of speeches, has said, what a shame it is that we don't have universities in that top 200. So one of the things that we have done is we have actually met with a couple of the ranking agencies to find out what goes into their rankings and why is it that Indian universities don't qualify? Not because the rankings are an end in themselves, but if the rankings reflect something that we are not doing right, we need to find out about it. So I personally met with the Times Higher Education people and the QS people. The Times Higher Education people even held a day-long meeting, a seminar, to explain their ranking structure. And one of the most interesting things I discovered is that in the Times Higher Education ranking, 30% of the ranking is just for research. Another 30% is for citations, and that is citations of published research. So basically 60% of the ranking of a university is entirely dependent on its research output and the extent to which this research output is cited elsewhere. But in India, as you know, our universities have traditionally been teaching universities and have done relatively little research. And much of India's research is done in small specialized institutions where there is not much by way of teaching going on. So the combination of teaching and research is not widely prevalent in India. And this is why our universities simply don't have a chance to figure. Now, as I said, we asked ourselves, why should this be so? Why don't we have more and better emphasis on research in our country? 
And we feel we need that. Again, not for the rankings, but because that is the hallmark of a good scientific and technological and engineering education in the world today. If a place like QSAT had more resources to devote to research, the results would also see the prestige of the university rising, and it would be reflected also in the global rankings. That is the essential issue. Now, our prime minister said a few years ago that he wanted to double the percentage of GDP we spend on research from 1% to 2%. The sad truth is we have not been able to make any progress in that direction. We're still at around 1%. So the problem is we're not being able to devote enough money to research. One of the reasons for that is that India unusually, 80% of the research and development money that is spent in our country is spent by the government. Whereas in the Western countries, the developed OECD countries, 75% of all research and development expenditure comes from the private sector. Now, we can't become like the West, but we have a large and thriving private sector. Why can't they put more money into research? It's striking that a number of foreign companies, GE, Philips, IBM, employ more researchers in India than they do in their parent countries. So why can't we expect Indian companies to come to IITs and Indian Institute of Science and QSAT and they say, look, if you have students who are interested in researching in such and such an area, we will finance that research. And then you can decide how to divide up the profits or the benefits of that research if there are any commercial applications. Companies need research all the time. It doesn't only have to be done by employees, it can be done by students too. And in the many, many other countries, particularly in the Western world, this is not an uncommon practice, whereas in India it is quite unheard of. We need to be able to open the space, get more money into research, and we need to be able to help you young people to fulfill the potential that you undoubtedly have. Ours is a young country. We have 17% of the world's brains but we're only producing 2.8% of the world's research output. That must change. And one of the ways this must change is by improving the quality of an institution like QSAT and other scientific and technological institutions so that we can come up with cutting edge, state-of-the-art research in the fields of study you're in. There is absolutely nothing wrong with Indian minds. Indian minds have flourished everywhere in the world they've gone. What we have, where we have failed you is in creating the structure for these minds to flourish and in creating the opportunities for you to actually take advantage of the, of the era in which we live now, the era of the information revolution, the era of research and development. I've already spoken far too long. I'm actually supposed to be visiting my mother who lives in Kochi, so I'm going to leave. But let me just say before leaving the stage how pleased I am to see you all. As I've said earlier, this is a young country, and you are already representatives of the majority in this country. You represent not only the future, but the present. This is already your country. The job of my generation and those older than me, who are still in positions of authority, is to equip you to take advantage of the undoubted talent and potential that you have. So uh, I congratulate QSAT on having made your life here more pleasant on the campus by creating this, this uh, multi-story amenity center. I encourage QSAT in its hard work and efforts to become an IIEST, and I look forward to the day when cutting edge research will come out of this institution, thanks to bright young people like you that will take the world by storm. Thank you for welcoming me. I formally inaugurate the center. Jai Hind, namaskar.